just outside Phoenix, Arizona, stands the Champlin Fighter Museum with its magnificent collection of historic aircraft. Among the many exhibits, this one, a Focke-Wulf Model 190, stands supreme. It's a pristine example of one of the truly great aircraft of the Second World War. Revered by pilots on both sides, the 190, in its various forms, saw service wherever the Luftwaffe fought from 1941 onwards. A remarkable thing about the 190 is that despite its success, it was originally a plane that nobody wanted. Seen rather as an unnecessary insurance policy that would never be called upon. Yet before the war ended, it was to be the backbone of Germany's conventional fighter strength, constantly modified and improved. Adolf Galland, General of Luftwaffe Fighters, recommended cancelling all other piston-engined interceptors to concentrate on 190 production. It takes many skills and disciplines to perfect an aircraft like the 190, and in the end it must be the result of team effort. But if any one person can be identified with the success of this model, and the drive behind its ultimate adoption by the Luftwaffe, that man was Kurt Tank. Tank had previously designed aircraft for the Focke-Wulf company when it competed unsuccessfully against the fabled Messerschmitt 109. Certainly by the late 1930s, the 109 was seen as invincible and in no need of replacement for years to come. Light, streamlined and very effective, the 109 embodied all of the new technology of the day, whereas Tank's less competitive design was a high-wing parasol concept that seemed to belong to an earlier decade. By 1937, large numbers of 109s were being produced for Hitler's Luftwaffe. After the failure of his first fighter, Tank went on to concentrate on other concepts. Very much a leader, he inspired other designers. And as early as 1936, he brought together the talents that produced one of the most advanced airliners of that time. The FW-200 Condor wouldn't have looked out of place as a post-war airliner. In the event, wartime needs overtook the airliner concept and the FW-200 was pressed into service as a long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft, which plied the Atlantic, often working in conjunction with U-boat raiders. The 200's only serious flaw was its weak undercarriage. Also typical of Tank's creativity was the FW-189, unofficially referred to as the Owl. The 189 was an army observation design which utilized two small engines to power a shape that resembled an airborne glass house. The Owl provided tremendous strength in what was basically a very light airframe. Much respected by those who flew it, this simple yet honest design would see service throughout the Second World War as probably the best of its type available anywhere. In 1937, the war was still distant and Germany reveled in its newfound prosperity. The Third Reich had brought order and a renewed sense of national pride to a nation that had suffered harsh treaty conditions after the First World War, followed by a cruel depression. Now there was purpose. There was also planning. Planning for a new Germany with wider borders. And planning for a new Luftwaffe. Much of the success of the 109 was due to its Daimler-Benz 600 series engine, a brilliant piece of engineering. It had an inline configuration with 12 cylinders laid out in two rows. This followed the thinking of the day that a long, narrow engine offered a more streamlined shape, which in turn would allow the plane to go faster. The 600 series was also used in the Messerschmitt twin-engine fighter, the 110. It offered the same advantages, low drag, higher speed. 
And as always in the design of fighters, the constant quest was for speed. In 1937, the inline engine was in almost universal use in fighter aircraft. British Hurricanes utilized the Rolls-Royce Merlin, providing a similar combination of a powerful engine and a streamlined airframe. This is the Vought 141, an American pre-war design that was never adopted, but one example was sold to Japan. It was later quite wrongly held that the Empire used it as the basis for its own fighter designs. Rather than using an inline engine, the 141 employed an air-cooled radial concept, with the cylinders arranged in a circle around the crankshaft. Less aerodynamic than the inline, radial engines were nevertheless popular with the American Navy, because they were more reliable and didn't require the added complication of a radiator. They were also shorter, and thus more planes could be carried on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The Pratt & Whitney Company, in particular, continued to develop the radial engine as an alternative to the streamlined water-cooled type. But apart from Navy fighters, their main use was as commercial or bomber aircraft, where the last ounce of speed was not quite so critical. In the early 1930s, some of Pratt & Whitney's sturdy radial engines were sold to Germany and later were manufactured under license by the BMW company. Despite the success of the Messerschmitt 109, there were still some people in the Luftwaffe who insisted on the need for a second fighter. Daimler-Benz simply couldn't produce more engines. And for this reason, a Focke-Wulf design was accepted as a backup because it utilized a BMW radial, which was less in demand. Kurt Tank and his team had support for their idea from several sources. Earlier there had been the Howard Hughes H1 racer. It too utilized a radial engine and so lacked a smooth pointed shape. But the overall output from the power plant, coupled with the plane's other aerodynamic features, resulted in a formula that still provided one of the fastest aircraft of its time. Clearly Tank was impressed by the design, which also featured a wide track undercarriage for safer landings. personally flew the H1 on many record-breaking flights, proving that there was a situation where extra horsepower compensated for the lack of aerodynamics. Another successful application of the radial, which Tank would almost certainly have known about, was the early development of Japan's A6M0, produced for the Imperial Navy. This design was still secret in 1937. It used an American-designed cowl which surrounded the engine and provided a limited amount of streamlining. But it derived its speed and maneuverability from its light weight. The weight reduction came at a price because Zero pilots were not provided with armored protection. In contrast, most other fighters would have used a heavy metal shield against enemy bullets. Other features were also sacrificed, like self-sealing fuel tanks, which would have provided added safety but increased the aircraft's weight. These omissions were made not out of any disdain for Japanese fighter pilots. Rather, it was a pragmatic formula to give the Zero speed with tremendous agility. And these two factors alone were expected to increase the pilot's chances of survival and at the same time produce a much more effective weapon. There's no doubt that the Zero's formula was successful and it did demonstrate that with some improvisation it was possible to use radial engines and still obtain high speed. The question was, how could you do this in an all-metal aircraft with modern safety features? German engineers designed a special aerodynamic cowl, 
which provided only the smallest inlet for air, but increased the flow with a unique fan mounted behind the propeller. The normal cowl arrangement, which had been perfected in America and used around the world, was effective, but undoubtedly reduced speed. The modified German approach, which Kurt Tank adopted for his new fighter, appeared to be a major step forward. But there were still grave doubts about the auxiliary fan's efficiency, given that the air intake aperture was so small in relation to the large BMW engine. But there was no doubt about the plane Kurt Tank put behind the engine. Sleek and streamlined, strong and yet simply built, the Focke-Wulf Model 190 was a design masterpiece. By early 1939, the jigs and tools necessary to assemble the 190 were being put into place. But right from the start, the plan was not only to have an aircraft for mass production, but to have production spread amongst a number of subcontractors, each one turning out large numbers of specific parts. Even in 1939, long before Germany suffered Allied bomber raids, the German high command could see the merits of mass production through a decentralized supplier system, which would continue turning out the tools of war in small factories that would be elusive targets for the Reich's enemies. Before the war's end, FW-190s would be sourced from no less than 24 different points of manufacture. The model was no light weight. Fully fueled at takeoff, it would weigh almost 10,000 pounds, as against 8,000 pounds for its Messerschmitt counterpart. But the extra weight made for a stronger plane. This paid major dividends and allowed the model to survive in the worst of conditions. But the big question still remained. Would the added power of the BMW 193 18-cylinder engine be enough to compensate for the extra weight and drag of the Focke-Wulf design against the ME 109? Given that all the inline engines available for fighter production had already been committed to the Messerschmitt company, Kurt Tank had no choice but to try and design his way around the unpopular radial technology. When this prototype was nearing completion, few would have imagined it to be the first of over 20,000 FW-190s. Another difference from the Messerschmitt was that whereas the 109 had demountable wings joined to the fuselage by a single spar, Kurt Tank's plane used very strong wings which were bolted together as one piece before the fuselage was positioned above. And even the joints were concealed behind an aerodynamic plate to increase strength and speed. Everything reflected the philosophy of Kurt Tank, keeping design simple, making components strong, but at the same time maximizing the technology that was available, like electric power for control surfaces and the operation of the undercarriage. There was also a clever spring device that activated the tail wheel. Soon the BMW engine was ready for fitting. This key component for the whole project was about to be tested in combination with the new formula of power, weight and aerodynamics. On June the 1st, 1939, with Focke-Wulf's test pilot Hans Sanders at the control, the first 190, known as V1, taxied down Bremen's airfield to put the new theories to the test. There was elation and disappointment. Sanders quickly established that the 190 had excellent maneuverability and that the engine's extra power compensated for the plane's weight. But the cooling system simply didn't work. Sanders said it was like flying with his feet in a fireplace while he endured the shortcomings of the new aerodynamic cowl. But still, this was a problem that could be solved. 
The basic concept of the well-balanced shape supporting a very powerful engine with the added safety of a wider undercarriage was impressive. And as with all prototypes, it would take time to perfect the idea and still more time to put improvements into production. In the middle of 1939, the Wehrmacht needed just a little more time for many of its new inventions to be perfected. And it achieved this with one of the greatest charades in history. Given that Hitler had already stated his ambitions in the East, and the fact that the ideologies of Russia and Germany were so opposed in theory, it's hard to imagine how the non-aggression pact signed in the summer of 1939 could have had any real influence. In fact, both sides merely used it as a breathing space, a time for Russia to consolidate and for Germany to expand westward. As the 190 was only seen as a backup to the Messerschmitt, there was time to perfect the new aircraft. The problem with the engine was solved by using an even more powerful BMW radial. The model BMW 801 was also heavier, so to retain the plane's center of gravity, the pilot's position was pushed back, thus reducing the heat problem. However, the aerodynamic cowl was doomed to failure. But overall, Kurt Tank's design was evolving into a winning formula. And Reichmarschall Goering gave instructions that Focke-Wulf should prepare to expand production of the new fighter, like so many hot rolls in a bakery. Production model 190s reverted to a conventional cowl, and with the pilot now further away, he was completely insulated from excessive heat. Although an internal cooling fan was still provided behind the plane's propeller. The fact is that the small aerodynamic benefit from the original cowling system was easily offset by the added power of the new engine. And it was the BMW 801 radial that contributed so much to the success of the early model 190s. It also gave the pilot a massive shield against a head-on attack. And because there was no complicated radiator system, there was simply less to go wrong. There was also the advantage of accessibility. Ground crews could reach almost every corner of the power plant for quick and effective repair. There were other advantages over the Messerschmitt. The 190 had a high canopy which offered the pilot all-round visibility. And in an emergency, the perspex hood could be blown off with explosive charges. Attention to detail in design produced other refinements in the 190. Like an external fuel gauge and the hinge panels for quick and easy access by ground crews and for tighter seals. There was even a footplate provided on the wing, so that crews didn't dent the softer covering panels. By the summer of 1941, early production Model 190s were becoming operational, with fighter group JG-26 under Adolf Galland. Then on the 27th of September, 190s engaged British Spitfires over the Channel for the first time. The result was a staggering defeat for the British. The RAF also had other problems because Messerschmitt had continued to upgrade its 109 with its F and G models. And now the debate raged within the Luftwaffe as to which was really the better German fighter. It was largely a matter of opinion. Werner Seitz, a Luftwaffe pilot, explains. I liked that 190 very much. It was a much better airplane than the 109. You could curve it, you could fly fast, high, you could practically do everything with that aircraft. It was wonderful. The only handicap what had happened with the 190, when you take that plane out to your takeoff, you couldn't see very much. 
so that that very large radial engine took away your fishing. And, uh, but you get used to it, so you'll be more careful. But flying that plane was a lot of fun. But not all Luftwaffe pilots embraced the Focke-Wulf design. Even though the Messerschmitt had a narrow undercarriage which made it difficult to control and an extremely small canopy, it was still the first choice of many pilots, including General Gunther Rahl. I named the 109 a Florette and the 190 a Sabre. The 190 was a rocket aircraft, but the 190 had a very good setup of weapons. They had four weapons around the engine, very close to the engine. And uh, you see, you can uh, find that the, uh, the serious kills in a day, up to 13, 14, like when Novotny had, were done with the 190. But Novotny gained most of those kills over Russia. No sooner had the 190 come into service than Hitler finally made his move in the east in a surprise attack against the still unprepared Soviets. Operation Barbarossa literally destroyed the Red Air Force. And as the few remaining aircraft were obsolete with poorly trained crews, the early results against the sophisticated FW-190 were all too predictable. The Russians didn't have any experience. The pilots were not trained in tactics. Uh, they flew very obsolete equipment, maybe uh, from the Spanish War. The main bulk of their fighter fleet was uh, the, the J-16 Rata, is the nickname, and the J-153, a biplane. And uh, so the outcome was, you know, they suffered tremendous losses. By December 1941, on the other side of the world, Germany's ally, Japan, was also preparing for a spectacular success. The Imperial Navy's Mitsubishi Zero, the plane which had earlier proved that radial engines still had a place in a fighter aircraft, was about to make its mark in history. Together with torpedo and dive bomber carrier planes, Zeros began their attack on the American 7th Fleet, based in Pearl Harbor. Unable to catch the American carriers in port, the Japanese attack, although impressive, was not conclusive. It did, however, achieve an adverse result for Germany. 24 hours after the raid, Hitler declared war on the United States and thus sealed the fate of the Reich. American production capacity was enormous. By early 1942, hordes of giant four-engined bombers, like the Boeing B-17 Fortress, flying from bases in England, slowly began to test the theory of high-altitude strategic bombing. Using powerful turbo superchargers, the B-17s operated at 30,000 feet above Germany, where the FW-190's radial engine was stretched to the limit. Now on the defensive, the Luftwaffe needed a high-altitude interceptor, a type that would usually use an inline engine like the Daimler-Benz which was still in short supply. But Kurt Tank solved the problem in a different way. This is the Junkers Model 88. It was a versatile bomber that used several different engines, amongst them the Yumo 213. Round in shape, it looked like a radial, but was in fact a V12 inline engine with a circular radiator just behind the propeller. Unlike the Daimler-Benz, the Yumo engine was in plentiful supply. And in a bold move, Tank arranged for this engine to be fitted to the 190. With this combination of a bomber engine grafted into a fighter airframe, Focke-Wulf started to develop 
what may well have been the best fighter of World War II. Of course, the shape of the Yumo engine considerably added to the overall length of the new aircraft, the D-series, as this model became known. The added power and the ability to fly at great height would later make the long-nosed 190s the most respected of all German fighters. In developing the D-series, Focke-Wulf had to confront the same problems as with the original prototype. By putting more weight ahead of the wing, an adjustment had to be made to the rear to achieve balance. To tank, the solution was simple. He merely inserted a crude distance piece to extend the aft section by some 10 inches. The end result with its stretched nose and tail made the D-series over five feet longer than the basic version. Sleek and streamlined, there were still features like the large three-bladed paddle propellers ideal for cutting through the thin air at 30,000 feet. Brilliantly designed and carved from wood. The D-Series also enjoyed many of the proven features of the 1940 design. The wings, undercarriage and cockpit were all much the same as in the radial powered short-nosed version, which still remained in production. Both types use the same flight control system, extremely advanced for the time. All 190s had some electrically controlled flight services, which did away with cables and hydraulic lines using instead thin, low voltage electric cable, less exposed to the enemy. Because this system evolved around electric power, the battery was a vital component and was stored in an armored compartment safe behind the pilot. Even as the D-series was being developed, there were plans for a still more advanced version, stretched yet again, and this time with longer wings. The TA-152 actually permitted Kurt Tank's initial T to be used in the aircraft's nomenclature. The only time this privilege was ever extended to a German designer, as against the company he worked for. But then Kurt Tank was no ordinary designer. Whether in the D-series or the extended 152, the basic FW190 concept was the core of the later model's successes. Back in 1937, Focke-Wulf had used some simple design ideas that were more than adequate for several stages of evolution. However, as good as the new generation of high-altitude planes were, they came too late. Russian advances were changing things in the East. What uh, was a surprise to us, they managed to set up a new production or production lines beyond the reach of our bombers, which was in most cases beyond the Ural Mountains or in, in this area. And they ran up to tremendous production numbers. They came. Better aircraft, all this MiG, Yak, Lak type aircraft, very good. And better trained pilots, and later on, from N42 onwards, they formed these elite units, uh, Red Banner Guard regiments. And in my area, at least in my area, we could identify them because they painted from the nacelle to the cockpit the aircraft in red color. So you could identify these are the elite. This was a very uh, adequate component. Uh, a new generation of Russian pilots, together with their more advanced aircraft, would help turn the tide against Germany.
Still, the 190 had yet to reach the limits of its versatility. The Russian campaign had shown that the basic German ground attack plane, the Stuka, was obsolete. And when its replacement, the Messerschmitt 210, did not materialize, the reliable 190 was put forward as a substitute. Though not designed specifically to fill this need, the 190 was flexible enough to be adapted. The 190 attack version, or F-series, was much like the basic short-nosed design, although with extra hard points to mount bomb loads on the wing and under the main fuselage. The result was a basic fighter design able to carry bombs as a dedicated attack plane. Versatility wasn't always the answer. As the war in the East continued, German pilots had to contend with very specialized Russian aircraft like the IL-2 Stormovik, which proved a real problem to 190 fighters. The uh, IL-2 was a dangerous airplane, you know. It was very hard uh, to shoot it down because it was heavily armored. Down, downwards, and backwards. We had a gunner in the back. And uh, you had to aim very accurately to, to get it, you know. And very easily, I know a lot of pilots who were really got rid of the whole ammunition and were still flying. The inability of German fighters to stop Soviet aircraft, like the Stormovik, certainly influenced the tank battles on the Eastern Front. These duels in armor really produced the outcome of the Russian campaign. Adding to Germany's plight, huge quantities of Allied munitions were now being shipped to the south in a campaign to ensure that Russia lacked for nothing in her fight against Germany. We got to Ivan on the uh, land lease program, the uh, Spitfire, the P-39, the B-25, the Boston bomber, and uh, in the south there was a high percentage uh, of those aircraft, uh, Anglo-American uh, origin. This policy of supplying the Soviets from Western production lines ensured that the beleaguered German war machine was kept under constant pressure by the Red Forces in the East and by the British and the Americans from the South and West. But tactics varied. The Soviets concentrated heavily on the ground war and the aircraft they used supported this policy. Whereas the Americans, devotees of the long-range heavy bomber concept, took their war to Germany from the air. By the end of 1944, American daytime bombing was putting dreadful pressure on Luftwaffe fighter defenses. Messerschmitt 109s and all versions of the FW-190 were pressed into service in an attempt to stem the tide of B-17s and Liberators as they wreak destruction on the fatherland. But the success of US bombing could only come after the planes had battled past the German defenses. And to achieve this end, first long-range high-speed American escort fighters would be employed, giving protection as far into Germany as possible. And then the bombers would be grouped together in what became known as tight boxed formations, which enabled the gunners to maximize defensive fire. Now the American bombers continued their missions, specifically targeting the main contributors to the German war effort. Ammunition factories, refineries, and most of all, of course, aircraft factories. The theory behind American strategic bombing had always been to deny the enemy the ability to produce weapons. Damage right at the source of production was the most efficient form of warfare. But this only worked when the enemy made his weapons in a conventional way. And that's not how Court Tank envisaged FW-190 production.
hundreds of subcontractors spread across the nation actually increased the supply of parts despite the bomber attacks. And the flow of new 190s coming off the production lines continued to the amazement of American planners. Colonel Fred McIntosh of Air Force Intelligence explains. They were made in sections in small factories, and then they were put together at an airport. And then the airplane, even then, may or may not be flown from there and but towed down the highway to the place to where the engine could be involved or whatever was necessary. And a place that would make very fine furniture in other words, the woodwork and cabinet shop was making tail assemblies for airplanes. What the 8th Air Force had to contend with was a well-organized network of cottage industries, almost impossible to identify as a strategic target. These tiny factories worked on, completely immune to the 8th Air Force's endeavors. And the fact that they were so successful can be traced back to Fock Wolf's original idea to subcontract and diversify as many of the production elements of the 190 as possible. Even as the war rolled on to its conclusion, the basic radial powered 190 was still a match for anything that the Allies could put into the air. But Allied designs had improved. Planes like the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, which had also been designed around a radial engine, arrived in large numbers and with well-trained pilots. There was carnage on both sides. And often the B-17s that did get home brought with them plenty of evidence of just how effective German 190s were in the defense of the homeland. Even though their cause was lost, Luftwaffe pilots hard pressed for fuel and ammunition still offered a defiant resistance. But the bomber raids would continue on as German defenses slowly melted away. And the German people were left with only the ruins of a Reich that was supposed to last a thousand years. Around the now occupied country, American Air Force intelligence teams moved quickly to collect examples of German technology before they were destroyed by retreating troops. It was a risky business. Some aircraft had been wrecked by their German crews and others had even been booby-trapped. But mostly they were just simply standing, abandoned as tools for a war that could not be won. In this way, Allied intelligence came across scores of FW-190s, providing many specimens to examine and compare. Of course, the Allies already had a few captured 190s, so they were well aware of the design philosophy behind the plane. But now there was an abundant supply, and technical experts from American manufacturers were flown in to make first-hand appraisals of German aircraft. Men like Bell Aircraft Chief Test Pilot Jack Willems. I checked him out, uh, gave him a cockpit check in, an, in a Fock Wolf that I had already checked and flown, and he took off. Now, he is an American trained, competent test pilot and winner of, of several races in the Thompson Trophies in Cleveland. Uh, after he had taken off, I turned to work with some other crew members. And the next thing I knew was, here comes Jack Willems in the Fox Wolf 190, about 35 to 50 feet off the ground, wide open, across the aerodrome. He pulls it up, rolls it several times, and Shondell's away. So where are they now? 
Over 20,000 190s were built, but very few survive today. Here at the Texas Air Museum in Harlingen, near the Mexican border, is one of the few surviving short-nosed 190s. Even though it's now showing the ravages of time, its classic lines are still impressive. A clean and simple shape built around a powerful engine still pleases the eye of aircraft connoisseurs. But it's the historians who know how remarkable this plane really was, and who'd welcome the chance to see one fly again. They may have to wait for several years before the Texas plane is rebuilt to that standard. But in the interim, the same beautiful proportions can sometimes be seen in the blue skies of Texas, courtesy of a committed private aircraft builder, David Jones, who talks about his passion and the plane he built. In order to build this, I studied it pretty thoroughly, and I was quite amazed at the things I ran into, how well built it was. And something that a lot of people didn't know is that the airplane had a single power control lever in it. In, uh, I think in 1980 or 81, Woodward Governor Company built a single power control for Beechcraft. So I asked them if I could use that in this airplane. And when I asked them, I also told them about the Falk Wolf's single power control. They didn't even know that anyone had ever built one before. And this in David's replica of a wartime 190 is made to three-quarter scale. And of course it has a different engine. But all of the proportions are exact. So this remarkable reproduction flies in the same impeccable manner for which the originals were so famous and which endeared them to Luftwaffe pilots as they fought their way across Europe. <laughs> 